If you'll turn your Bibles with me, with me to Matthew chapter 1. And we're just going to read verse 18, but before I do all that, um, there was a time where I didn't, I didn't really appreciate uh, Christmas. Uh, there's a lot of things in connection with Christmas uh, that I disagree but I feel like I haven't come full circle, but I've come circle somewhat. And looking at things doctrinally, looking at things uh, regarding the greatness and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, the incarnation is a tremendous thing uh, to comprehend uh, and to endeavor to come to know. One of the things that I love doing is taking things that I see uh, Paul, our apostle, highlight. And it's going to be one of our themes as we look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he takes the base things, uh, the weak things of the world, and to be able to see that principle elsewhere in Scripture. And I think one of the most prominent times in which that took place, uh, as it does every single day with each and every one of us, but that we have in Scripture is surrounding the Incarnation. Um, whom He uses, where they're from, where He's born, uh, all of those things highlight this, this theme of who God is. Uh, who He uses. And it highlights, uh, it grants us and gives us an understanding of His mercy. His grace and His love. Of course, this is going to climax and the epitome of it is going to be manifest when He dies on the cross. Um, but we see it in every aspect of His life here on earth. Uh, and we see it, of course, in His conception. And we see it in connection with His birth as well. And so I was thinking about what, what the title of a series and uh, I stole it from angels we have heard on high. Uh, come to Bethlehem and see. And uh, we're going to end all this in our final lesson, answering the question of the, the wise men and the entourage when they come to Jerusalem, where they say, where is he? And I'm going to play off of it, of not where is he in answering the question at that time, but now in view of what we know, now in view of the incarnation, in view of his, uh, his, his birth, and in view of what he did uh, in his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, where is he? Uh, we can ask the same question, but our answer is different. And uh, that's a glorious thing. So we're going we're gonna to travel through those things and looking at various themes in, in connection with it. And I want to start here just by reading verse 18, and then we're going we're to go from there after I pray. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Father, we're thankful for this time to look at your word, and your word that reveals you. And the word that reveals the express image of your person, the Lord Jesus Christ. How fantastic, how awesome are these things to consider at, at any time. But may we take advantage of the time in which it is often thought to think about, uh, and that is this time in December. Uh, but may we bring these things with us uh, all the time. And... Never allow the dullness of this world to infringe upon the glory of the Incarnation and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, you can hold your hand here. If you come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to be referencing this often. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because again, when we start to look at the, the Incarnation, we start to look at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and all the things that surround it, uh, we begin to see that they are proof in one sense of what the Apostle Paul speaks about here. 
in connection with us. He says here in verse 25, he says, because the foolishness of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 25, is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Then he goes on to say, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. There, there's so much to unpack here, but I just want to bring your attention to this, this, this paradigm of God's use of things that are frowned upon and looked down upon in the eyes of the world to bring to naught the things that are elevated and exalted in the world. This issue of foolish things to confound the wise. The weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty of the world. The base things of the world and the things which are despised. God hath chosen those things. He chose them. This isn't a happenstance. Uh, This isn't uh, just comes out of nowhere. He deliberately and actively chooses those things, the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. And He's got a purpose for doing it that way. That is that no flesh, with their mightiness, their, their nobility, with their wisdom, with their mightiness, with their things that are, that none of that would glory in His presence. It's about Him, not about us. It's not that we don't glory. It's just what do we glory in? Well, if He made Christ, if He made Christ to be everything for us, then our glory is in the Lord. We glory, but not as the the world glories. We glory like the flesh glories, but not like the flesh glories. We don't glory, we don't boast in the flesh. We glory in the Lord. And as we consider these two that the Lord uses, Mary and Joseph, and as we consider the the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, one in Matthew chapter one, one in Luke, another one in Luke chapter three, when we consider uh, in the next lesson the heavenly host and who they come to, when we think about the incarnation itself, uh, none of that by, by fleshly perspective and appearance is anything to be gloried of. That is why we glory in it. That, that is why it, it rejoices my heart because in that there's, there's lessons to be learned. There's, there's implications to be understood. That I don't need to be mighty and noble in the world. That I, that I don't need to be great I don't need to profess myself to be wise. I just need to be in Christ. I need to be glorifying Him. I need to know Him. That's what counts. That's what matters. And that's what He he uses. And that paradigm and that dichotomy is something that we should always remember. We don't have time to go over to chapter 2 where He's going to describe the spirit of the world and the spirit which is of God and that the Holy Ghost compares spiritual things with spiritual. He takes the things of this world and the things which are of God and he compares the two to show you which one is greater. It's a way in which the Spirit teaches. And we see that when we consider uh, the incarnation and the things surrounding it. And so as we we come to Bethlehem, if you will, uh, to see, uh, to pick up on another song during this time, I ask you, do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? Do you understand 
what I understand. And what is greater? Do you see what the Scripture provides? Do you hear what the Scripture provides? Do you understand what the Scripture provides uh, regarding, of course, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, but in the means by which He does it all? And the channel, the, 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 the way in which He does it, choosing weak things. And so we'll refer to that reality as we go on. Uh, if you will, if you come back to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, we'll have time to visit the genealogy that is given uh, prior to verse 18 here. Uh, but it says in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. I first want to develop the issue of, of Bethlehem. Now, they're, uh, they're in, in Nazareth of, of Galilee. They're going to, in regards to the census, as we read in the narrative in Luke chapter 2, they're going to head towards Bethlehem uh, because of the taxation and all those kind of things. But I want us to, to start by looking at the issue of Bethlehem. Uh, and the significance, or should I say the insignificance, of Bethlehem. In one sense, significant, but in another sense, insignificant. That's where we are. It's significant because of what God does with it, but when we look at it by all uh, fleshly measurement, it's, it's insignificant. And then it, it, there's going to be a focus. As we begin to look at Bethlehem, there's going to become a focus on an individual in the Old Testament, David. And then from there, we'll move our way into dealing with Mary and Joseph here mentioned in verse 18. And so uh, I want you to come with me to Romans chapter 1. I want you to see the significance of David as that's where we're headed. Come with me to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, when the Apostle Paul describes he's separated under the gospel of God, he has very specific details in connection with that gospel. He says in verse 1 that he separated unto it, and in verse 2, he says, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That is a very important thing when it concerns the gospel of God that Paul is separated unto. Uh, come over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In the first doctrinal epistle that we enter into Romans, and then the last epistle that Paul writes, we see him later on as Paul the aged. He brings this issue up. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7 it says, Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So not only the gospel of God, but when Paul talks about his gospel, he wants to make sure that everyone understands when he speaks of Jesus Christ, he is Jesus Christ of the seed of David. There's a historical uh, understanding that we ought to have when it comes to Jesus Christ and Paul's Gospel. And sure, he was raised from the dead. Uh, he was made of the seed of David. Now come back with me as we look at Bethlehem to Micah. Although not the first time made mention of. Come with me to Micah chapter 5. Now, this is one of the famous Christmas passages along with Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9. Hopefully you'll understand it's much more than just a, a Christmas passage. It's an incarnation passage. We look at Micah chapter 5, and I want you to take note of what Micah says of Bethlehem. Look at verse 1. Micah 5, verse 1. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops, he hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be, what? 
little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings from have been from of old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Uh, much there, but notice here the qualification, the description of Bethlehem Ephrata, little among the thousands of Judah. Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. A ruler of Israel, but coming out of this little location, little Bethlehem. O little town of Bethlehem, right? We sing. We get it from Micah chapter 5. Come with me to the first place it's made mention of. Uh, Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. There's a lot of history to Bethlehem. We're not going to be able to examine it all. Look at Genesis chapter 35 and... Pick it up here in verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, and she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Paul even brings up Rachel. We have this significant story that we're not going to be able to go into all the significance But what I want you to see is Rachel, she dies in the way to Bethlehem Ephrata. Ephrath. I'm probably not spelling these words correctly, so hopefully that doesn't hinder you from the points. But there it is, which is Bethlehem. All right? Look at at where this begins to focus now. Come with me to Ruth. The book of Ruth. Joshua judges Ruth. Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1 in verse 1. We'll have time to talk about Ruth a little bit more a little bit later, but look at Ruth 1 in verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So we're talking about hundreds of years later that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chelion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz takes place Come with me to the end, to Ruth chapter 4. But they come out of Bethlehem. And of course, when they return, they return to Bethlehem. Uh, that is Ruth and Naomi. All, the, all their, the, their husbands died. If you pick it up here in verse 11, look at Ruth 4 and verse 11. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah. Of course, they would highlight this history because we see Rachel in connection with Bethlehem that we saw in Genesis 35. And this is where they are. He says, Which two did build the house of Israel and do thou worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Now, what ends up happening is there's redemption that takes place and Ruth and Boaz have a child. I want you to notice 
who the child is, or at least refresh our memory. Verse 17, And the woman, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of who? Of David. And we see this little genealogy here in verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begat David. There in Bethlehem. Now, as I said, this begins to narrow its focus to David. Now come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now I've got to fill in a little bit of a gap here. Israel and their disobedience. Ask God of a king, rejecting God being their king in Israel's history at this time. And they want a king like the Gentiles. The noble, mighty Gentiles whom God has been destroying as Israel's been going through. And in wanting a king like the Gentiles, they choose, they get Saul, one who is great in stature, tallest in all of Israel, fleshly in that regard. And in 1 Samuel 16, Samuel even learns this lesson in understanding that Saul isn't going to be king forever, and he is to anoint the next king. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. So here we see Jesse that we saw in Ruth chapter 4 that comes from Obed. Comes from Boaz and, and Ruth. He says, For I have provided me a king among his sons. It doesn't say which son, it just says there is a king among his sons. Verse 2 And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. It's interesting, this is done under the cover of the present king. Of course, orchestrated by God himself. Kind of similar to the Lord Jesus Christ. Him coming, him being born under the cover of the, of the king. Uh, the, the, the rebellious king. Verse 4, And Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said peaceably, I am come to sacrifice in the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Samuel sure of himself. He's sure that this is the next king. He's, he's in one sense like Saul in this regard. Verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, implying that's what he's looking at. And where is he getting that from? We need a substitute for Saul. Look at Saul. We need one equivalent. And God's going to say, No, 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 no. no." He says, Because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the what? Now what is the colloquial expression used for David? A man after God's own what? Then Jesse called Aminadab and made him pass before Samuel and said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made uh, Shema to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. I think he's starting to get it. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the who? And behold, he keepeth the sheep. We see him. He's not a 
Now, he's young, of course, but we don't see him until later on as the military conqueror that he is, of course, at the Lord's hand. Uh, we start to see that with Goliath. Uh, but he's, he's young. Uh, he's, he's small in stature. How do we know this? Because Saul, his height of stature, when he goes to fight Goliath, he is to prove and test Saul's armor, and it's just not fitting. It's not fitting. But what does David proclaim? He comes in the name of the Lord. He's a man after God's own heart. And by the way, that's how Israel began. When they were coming out of Egypt, all their deliverance, all their redemption, all the victory over their enemies was done at the Lord's hand as they relied upon the Lord. And he was to, they were to teach, that was to be taught and taught. And yet when we see them going into the land, we see their rebellion, their, their rejection. They start fearing the chariots of iron. Not understanding they have the one who made iron. They have God. And yet they don't see Him as their king. And so God, now in view of these kings being there, uh, He has chosen the, the youngest. There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, He keepeth the sheep. Verse 11, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for he will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. This guy maybe doesn't look the most manly. He's young, of course. But that description is kind of in contrast to the countenance in which Samuel was looking upon in view of the countenance of Saul. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now I want you to see a little bit more of David in regards to this man after God's own heart. Come with me to uh, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Oftentimes when you think that a man after God's own heart is one that never sins. Now, that wasn't the case, of course, with David. But when he was aware of his sin, we see his response. The proper inward response. And I, I just want you to see this, this issue here. Verse 1 of Psalm 51, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Look what else he says in verse 15. It says, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Now they're under the law. He's under the law when sacrifices, animal blood sacrifices were given. And look what he says. He says, For thou desirest not sacrifice. David, the man after God's own heart, says, You don't desire sacrifices. He says, else would I give it. If that's what you desired, I would give it. He says, thou delightest not in burnt offerings. He knows God so much. He knows Him so intimately. He knows what God desires. He knows what He delights in. And He says, it's not the blood of these animals. So it begs the question, what is it? Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. And that's what he has before the Lord. That is the sacrifice that they were to take before the Lord when they offered their blood sacrifice. You don't have that sacrifice. You're just one that honors God with his lips, but their heart is far from him. That's going to be proven, of course, later on in history when the writer of Hebrews comes along and says that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. 
It's going to be manifest that that, isn't the, that wasn't the issue. But, but faith in a heart towards God in connection with sin, which they would have known by the law is not what He delights, it's not what He wants. And yet this sacrifice of blood you don't desire, you don't delight in, but the heart. That is what the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices were to teach them. Some learned the lesson, some did not. We see that, that two-way view in Scripture. The Pharisees, their fathers in the Old Testament, whom Isaiah spoke about. Again, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And then you see someone like David who says, I won't, you don't desire it, but you, you desire a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Now the reason why I go to this, again, is because you see something here in regards to that which is unseen. Insignificant to the, the common beholder. Right? A, a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. And yet that is the thing that God desires. That's the thing that delights Him. And thus following again the theme of these insignificant things to the world and the flesh is the issue of the heart. That, of course, is whom we see uh, Ruth and Naomi are. Boaz. We're going to come to Mary and Joseph. That's, that's reflective in them. It wasn't the, the, the noble and the mighty and the kings of the Lord's day in whom He used to, to bring uh, uh, to utilize for his incarnation. David is youngest. David is small in stature, but he is a man after God's own heart. You know, this kind of tenderness and meekness, uh, although, again, David, don't get me wrong, was valiant in fight, but not in and of his own strength, but in the Lord, that oftentimes is viewed as weak in the eyes of the world. As they say, meekness is weakness. And yet not with God. That is exactly what God is looking for. And that's exactly what His Word works. Now, Bethlehem, Little, Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, this peculiar situation and circumstance, out of it comes Obed and Jesse and David, David being the youngest. And now we fast forward and I want you to begin to look a little bit more with me in connection with Joseph and Mary. Uh, come with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Now, before we get a little bit more into Mary and Joseph, Let's get into them in regards to the genealogies given. There's two. Two genealogies given. And by the way, you're coming to a point here in Scripture where there's going to be a, a, a miraculous uh, conception and, and a, a miraculous birth, not in the sense of the birth really being any different besides of, of who is being born. Um, yet we see the lowly degree in which he is born. But this is not uncommon with God. Uh, we read in the Old Testament uh, with Abraham and Sarah. Uh, she's not able to have children. And God waits until Abraham and Sarah's bodies are dead to be able to have a child. And it is then in which God makes it so that they can have a child. Um, in Judges 13, Manoah and his wife there's a story in regards to that birth. And of course, they have Samson, the judge. You go forward a little bit. We were just in 1 Samuel back up to chapter 1 and you have Hannah. Uh, Hannah so longs for a child, but she, doesn't, she can't have one. She's married to, to Elkanah, who, by the way, has connections uh, with, Eph, he's a, with, the, with the Ephrathites, uh, which is interesting. Uh, Samuel has some origins in connection with Ephrathah. And you have, of course, come from uh, Samuel going to Bethlehem and going to Jesse in that house. And so you have 
these miraculous births throughout the testimony of Scripture. One, of course, uh, prior to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, Zechariah and Elizabeth and John the Baptist. Uh, they are both old as well. And they have a child, the, the, the cousin of, the, of Jesus, uh, John, who is going to be John the Baptist. And here we come to one that is new. It's a, it's a new thing, as Jeremiah says, that a woman would compass a man. A, a, a new thing that he does. And glorious and miraculous and peculiar, those other births and how they come about and the events surrounding them. But this one is above them all. Uh, this one is great. The genealogies, however, don't reflect the greatness of course, we see David through the eyes of faith and the man after his own heart, but uh, you, you look at these gene genealogies and, and specifically, you look at the one here in, in Matthew. And if you back up to where we were just historically, uh, to verse 5, even before that, he brings up Judas, begot Pharaohs in verse 3, and, and Zerah of Thamar. And you go back and deal with that. She's an adulteress. And you deal with the issue of verse 5, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. That's Rahab. Who was Rahab? She was a Gentile woman, and she was a harlot. This is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, his earthly descendants. And then you have Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Now Ruth, again, uh, you go back and your God will be my God, these things that she says, but she's a, she's a Moabite. And if you do some study on the issue of the Moabites and what God's going to do to the Moabites, not someone of no, noble position in a genealogy. One of the things that stands out to me in regards to this genealogy, if you were writing this gene genealogy from the flesh, from the appearance of everything, don't include them. Like, try to get around it. And I'm not just saying the women, the men as well. You know, take, take the different route. Now, of course, you're limited in doing that. And then you have verse 6, And Jesse begat David, the king. And David, the king, begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And we know of the adultery that took place with David and Bathsheba. Four women mentioned, two Gentiles. They were strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. One of them was in Harlot, the other one in Moabite. And, and the two Israelites mentioned here were both involved in adultery. That's in the genealogy. And yet, it's reflective of his whole reason why he's coming. Is it not? He's, he's coming to, to deal with man and their, their sin. He says later on during his earthly ministry that he, as a physician, does not come for those that are whole, but for the sick. He didn't come for the righteous, but for sinners. And we see that reflective in his genealogy. A royal line, yes, but not a very great royal line when you begin to look at the details. One that could be ridiculed, one that they did look at in ridicule. Uh, the, the leaders in Israel. And so, historically David, historically Bethlehem, his genealogy, all of it is lowly. All of it is, is insignificant in one sense. It's little. It's, it's small. And yet we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, these are the things that God has chosen. He has chosen to bring down all that. You exalt yourself, He's going to humble you. You humble yourself, He's going to exalt you. We have those parallel, the, that, that dichotomy uh, in the Scriptures, and, it, and it's all over the place. So he's got a lowly genealogy. But now, well, now, what about Mary and Joseph? 
We see them in Matthew 1, verse 18, but come with me to Luke chapter 1. What about Mary and Joseph? Luke chapter 1, and look at verse 26 first. It says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee. Oh boy. Named Nazareth. Really? There? If you know where there is, if you see what the Scriptures see and how the world views it, once again, this is, this is not to, to bolster an argument of fleshly bravado. Uh, this is not to add to anything, but rather adds to the lowliness of it once again. And not only does he go there again to, to a virgin spouse, to a man whose name was Joseph, and that is Mary, but look at chapter 2. Of course, if Mary's there, uh, Joseph is also there. Chapter 2, verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, un- into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So it, it would be one thing, hey, let's go t- we've got to go to Bethlehem, little Bethlehem, but hey, we're from Jerusalem. They're not from Jerusalem. They're from Nazareth. They're from Galilee. Now, to understand the derogatory expressions and the, the looking down upon Galilee and Nazareth, let's just look at a couple passages. Look at John chapter 1 in verse 46. This is, of course, when the Lord was older and starting to gather His disciples. And one of His own says this. Look at John chapter 1 and pick it up here in verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? I can't help but every time I read that verse, I think of Romans chapter 3. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And the city that he comes to, the reputation of it, where he begins his ministry and where his parents are from, is Nazareth, where it was said, is there anything good? Is there any good thing that can come out of Nazareth? It's interesting, later on in his earthly ministry, when he says, good master, right? The, the rich young ruler, good master. What's one thing I can do to inherit eternal life? He says, why callest thou me good? There is one that is good. Even God. He comes from a place where there's no good thing that can come from, apparently, and he is the only good thing. He's God in flesh. That's where he utilized the parents, the, his earthly parents, from. That's where he commences, by the way, his earthly ministry as well. In that place. By the way, this place, when the Lord goes away from the Pharisees and all those things, he, he goes there so that he wouldn't walk in Jewry. It was identified amongst many as and the reputation was the Galilee of the Gentiles. It was a part of Israel, but it had so much lost its Jewishness that it was identified as Galilee of the, of the nations, Galilee of the Gentiles. So infiltrated. Uh, in quoting Isaiah, Matthew comes along and describes uh, where there was great darkness, a light has sprung up. That's what was there in, in Galilee. So he, as the light, doesn't come to the light. He, as the light of the world, comes to darkness. He is the one that comes from heaven's glory. He comes to a place where there's no good thing. He starts his ministry there. His parents are from there. And then when he's born, he's not born in any greater place. He's born in, in little, the little town of Bethlehem. In Acts 2, this carries on with his disciples. Well, even before that, John 7, verse 41 
Others said, this is the Christ, but some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? In verse 52 of John 7, he comes along, they come along and they say, read, no, no prophet comes out of Galilee, which if they would have read, they would have understood that wasn't actually the truth. In Acts 2, verse 7, the day of Pentecost, when they're speaking in tongues, he says, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? They can't, these are unlearned men. That's exactly what's echoed in Acts 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. and They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Stick with Jesus, and you might be unlearned and ignorant in regards to the eyes of men, but you'll make a marvel, and you'll have the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that you'll need that will last forever. They were viewed by the world as unlo- That's why they were the, the, the fishermen. They didn't have the great education. They had the, the lowly jobs in the society and the economy of the day. And they were unlearned and they were ignorant in regards to the schools that w- the Jewish boys went to. They were Galileans. They didn't have a proper education to speak another language. And yet that's whom God utilized. My whole point was to emphasize this place, Nazareth, in Galilee, does not have a great reputation. It does not have a great reputation. And in Philippians chapter 2, he made himself of no reputation. Not only by taking on the form of a man, the form of a servant, but in the manner in which he does it, in his incarnation, in his birth, And that's going to carry on to his obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. That's the fullest degree in which he would make himself of no reputation. He would be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That is where Mary and Joseph come from. Now, Mary and Joseph, you can turn back to Matthew chapter 1, just as a frame of reference. Mary and Joseph from Nazareth, Uh, We, in one sense, don't know much about them. Again, from Nazareth, most likely, there's great indication that they were poor. Joseph, too, would have been poor. Some speculate that she might have been as young as 12 or 13. Some speculate that Joseph may be 15 or 16. Uh, Joseph is a just man. We see that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, when he finds out that Mary is pregnant. And of course, they were espoused, they were betrothed, which was in that time binding. It was as if they were legally married, even though there was not yet any formal ceremony until usually a year, a year later. Uh, but the engagement was to confirm the partner's fidelity. They would have little or small social contact with each other. Yet both were faithful during their engagement period, their betrothal. Young, Joseph hearing that Mary was pregnant, thinking that she might be unfaithful. He was a just man. He, he loved her. He wanted to uphold the law, yet at the same time, he loved her and he didn't want to shame her publicly. So he would seek to divorce her secretly. We know, of course, the story would go, and he, by the way, they had every right, according to law, Deuteronomy 22, verse 23 and 24, to stone her, according to judging by all appearance, right? But the angel comes to Joseph and tells Joseph what's going on. And he tells Joseph that Mary will bear a son. And his name is going to be Jesus. And Jesus means He will save His people from their sins. In the Greek, it's Jesus. It's the Greek form of the Hebrew, Joshua or Jeshua or Jehoshua. It means Jehovah will save. Now, how they would interpret Jesus and His name, He will save His people from their sins, uh, I think is telling throughout the gospel accounts. 
It's not that they really identified that they had sins, but rather maybe more or less from the, the, the fruit of what they were doing to deal with their enemies and those kind of things. Uh, but he would deal with their sin fully and completely, spiritually. These are the two that would be used as the Lord's earthly parents. Mary and Joseph. Now, just to make sure that we understand that these two are not anything significant, come with me to Luke, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And I want you to see a, a couple things here. Luke chapter 1, and uh, pick it up here first. You can see his, uh, they're going to call his name Jesus in verse 31. But look at the, when Mary meets Elizabeth here in verse 41. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now verse 42, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Right? And now Mary is going to respond to what Elizabeth says to her. Look at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. She's of low estate. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things. God is mighty and he can take the lowest state and do great things. And holy is his name. He, he, he's, he, of course, is holy, holy, holy. But one of the things that also is so distinct about him is this. His name and what he does and the way in which he does it. Verse 50, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud and the imagination of their hearts. You, you look at this and you think, where is this coming from? Mary is looking at her low estate. She's looking at what has been told her. She, can, she understands, she can feel Jesus in her womb. And the reality of what now has taken place, and she is magnifying the Lord. She sees and understands His greatness. And, the, and, and in comparison of who she is, she magnifies Him. And not only that, by way of God's use of her, she understands His holiness in that, she, he, that He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. The, the proud and the, and the noble and the mighty, this is the way they would do it, but holy is He. He doesn't do it that way. That's beautiful to me. Because when I look at myself, I need that. I need that holiness. I need what makes God different. I need... His compassion and His mercy and His grace. Because not only do I have sin, but there ain't much, in, much to have or to look at. There ain't nothing that's going to get me out of any spiritual predicament. There's not that, that gives me much in regards to the, a, a, a fleshly reputation in the world to get some kind of advantage. And I think you might say the same of yourself. He doesn't even, she doesn't stop there. Verse 52. He hath put down the mighty from their seats. By simply her carrying Jesus and her being of low estate, and she's looking where she's from, and she, again, they're going to they're, they're head to Bethlehem understanding that He hath put down the mighty from their seats. If there was any question in regards to God's holiness, by this time, 
Mary's coming to an understanding of what God, how great He is and how holy He is. How different He is than the world around her. Listen, this isn't even to add to the issue of birth itself. Conception. This thing that is no longer marveled at, but is frowned upon, and abortions accumulate upon abortions to the height of heaven. The, 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 the issue of, of the, the, the marital union, which is not done usually in marriage, and, and, and sex done outside marriage, before marriage, and all these kind of things, and, and lust run rapid, and, and people having children, and these kind of things. And it, there's such a, a beauty and a sacredness, and yet such an insignificant thing when the, when the seed of the man and the egg of the woman, it's, it's done almost invisibly. You, you need a microscope to see it. And that's the way in regards to her womb and, 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 and having child and that issue of conception, that's the way He's going to come. He doesn't just appear one day from the, from the east or from the west. He doesn't just come down on the clouds in heaven's glory as an adult. He comes this way. And through the channel of the womb, they would offer their children a sacrifice in the Old Testament. You had some who couldn't have children and they so much wanted to have children. And some who will just throw them to the side. You have Solomon when he's judging in Israel. And you have the two women and they have two children and they go to bed and the one accidentally kills her child and rolls over and kills it and switches out the dead with the live one. And then the one that wakes up whose child was actually alive but now had been traded goes before Solomon and the one, when Solomon says split them in half, give, I don't split, them, split the child in half, which means he's going to kill him. And the one woman that's not a child, she says, so be it. You would think there would be some kind of care and thought. What is a child? What is a babe? The most fragile state of our existence as when we're in the womb. And when we come out of the womb, not much has changed. Just a little bit of locations at that nine-month period of time. Weak, frail, dependent on everything. This is how He comes. This is where He comes. This is who He uses. This is where He's born. Mary, involved in it all, she... She's getting this. He had put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He had filled the hungry with good things and the rich he had sent empty away. He didn't use the rich. He didn't use the full. He used the poor and those of low estate. He used the ones that didn't have jewelry. He used this manner made of a woman in this weak and lowly way. I think that's one of the greatest themes of the Incarnation. We see the, the glory of it, of course. The Lord Jesus Christ. But the way in which He comes in every point you turn in the surrounding things of that reality, it's all of low degree. It's all of low estate. Reminds me of Romans 12 when Paul exhorts us to condescend to men of low estate. For he descended. He wasn't even, you know, of course, impossible, but he's not born a man. A child is given. A son is born. He would grow up physically just like the rest of us as the Gospel of Luke states. He would grow in wisdom and stature among men and God. God uses the weak things of the world. It says over in Romans 5, when we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. One of the major issues of man not believing in the Gospel is everything that this world feeds in regards to the flesh. Riches and food. All these things, and especially when we have really no want. 
and it makes us think we have it all, and this completely turns all of that on its head. You have nothing. And it's the poor, if they have Christ, that have everything. Look at that. Look at this, the same issue. Come over to 2 Corinthians with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm sorry, not chapter 4, chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And look what he says as we wrap up here. In verse 10, he's speaking about himself as a laborer of God. He says, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. That is highlighted all over the place in Scripture, but it is highlighted in the account of the Lord Jesus Christ and when He came. They called Him a friend of publicans and sinners, and that He was. Not for their behavior, but that's who He came to save. The world viewed that those aren't savable people and we're righteous. He came to save us. And, and the Lord says, no, I came to save sinners. I came to save those who are spiritually needy. And he manifests that in other earthly means in the fashion and the manner in which we've, we have examined here. He was made a man. He did not take on him the nature of angels. And we'll see this more as we go on. The angels who were, made greater, who were made greater in power and might. He was made a little lower than the angels. And we'll see that he's exalted with greater honor and glory than all of them. When we look at Mary and Joseph, think about where they came from. And do you see where they came from? When you think about Mary and Joseph, think about where they're headed to have that holy thing. That child, Jesus. And do you see and do you hear what that place was? When you think about Mary and Joseph, do you think about their low estate? When they went up to the, the temple because Jesus was their firstborn and offered sacrifice, they couldn't even offer a lamb. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and yet they can't bring a lamb and sacrifice. They bring two turtle doves. That what the poor were permitted and allowed by God to give when they didn't have enough. And it helps you to see what is the issue. It's not the flesh and everything of this world. It's not that. He showed us that when He came in the manner which He came leading up to the cross. And He shows that even in His exaltation because when He made Himself of no reputation, it was wherefore... Because of that, God hath highly exalted him. And therefore, it's okay to be lowly. It's okay to have nothing as long as we have the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, for us today, although we don't have Jesus in our womb like Mary did, it was given to Paul to have the Son of God revealed in him. And by the Spirit of God, we have Christ in us. A far greater thing in regards to, to us and the, the breath of it than what needed to take place, but what was taking place. So, I hope and pray that as you consider these things this time of the year, if you do consider them, uh, that you would see maybe with a different set of eyes and hear with a different set of ears and understand from the heart and not from the perspective of the world when it concerns the Lord Jesus Christ and all those around. And what we'll do is we'll continue on dealing with this as we look at the heavenly host and who they come to the night in which he's born. And then all climax, of course, in regards to when he comes and look at scriptures concerning that. And then to answer the question, where is he? Where is he now? And what a wonderful narrative and story that is for us, one that we ought to live by all the days of our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to examine uh, your word and to see these things and how great it is of what you use and that we can be useful. Oftentimes we, we judge ourselves by the world's judgment and it leaves us helpless and hopeless. And in one sense, Father, in view of all this, rightly so, for all those things are fleeting and fading. 
Uh, just like our life is but a vapor. And so it is that we look to the Lord Jesus Christ and Your holiness and Your great manner and Your godliness and how You think and what You've chosen. And may we align our lives with that in the details of our life and in our relationships one towards another. May we not have our flesh glory in Your presence but knowing that all that we have is in Christ and what you made Christ to be unto us. And therefore glory, not in the flesh, but glory in the Lord. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.